Hey guys, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story for you. If you are new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you get alerted when I post new videos. And if you have any more video ideas, you can let me know in the comments too. And now on to today's topic. So today we are going to talk about a group of six people that were all wrongfully convicted of a murder that they did not commit. So this group of people, they've been known as the Beatrice Six because this happened in Beatrice, Nebraska. It was a group of six people. And these people are Tom Winslow, Joseph White, Joanne Taylor, Deborah Sheldon, James Dean, and Kathy Gonzalez. So what had happened was on a cold night in early February of 1985, a grandmother type woman she was widowed and and had lived in this downtown beatrice uh, old lincoln telephone building um, that had been converted into apartments her name was was helen wilson so she lived in this downtown apartment um, her kids were all grown she had grandkids and she was a community volunteer and and uh you know a lot of people in the community knew her and uh Anyhow, she didn't feel well one night, so her son and daughter-in-law, they came over and and they had helped her clean up a bit, and and, and Helen had told her daughter-in-law, Katie, she's sorry she didn't make coffee, she just hadn't felt like drinking coffee since she hadn't felt well. And so, anyhow, the kitchen's spotless, and around 9.45 p.m., her son and daughter-in-law leave. So daughter-in-law Katie says she's going to call around midnight to remind her to take her pills. And she calls around midnight and gets no answer. She calls a little bit later in the night, um, doesn't say exactly what time. And the phone rings a couple times and then the line goes dead. So they go back to check on her the next morning around 9.30 or 10 in the morning. They find her dead on her floor. She's tied up and gagged and, and uh, she's laying on the floor there and she's bloodied up really, really good. There was a heck of a struggle or fight that had gone on. So the police come, they look at the crime scene, they determine that there's some marks on the door, maybe someone forced their way in, they couldn't tell for sure. There was a fresh pot of coffee made, there were cups in the sink that weren't there but the night before. There was a knife on the floor that came from the apartment, and, uh, and Helen's purse was there and still had $1,200 in it, and no one in the building had heard anything. So the police are investigating and trying to determine what happened. Um, they did note that there had been a couple attempted assaults of um, some older women, but they had um, screamed and gotten away. And so the uh, sexual assaults didn't happen in those cases. But in, in this case, Helen was sexually assaulted and uh, and was beaten and had a lot of broken bones and and everything. So as the police are looking over everything at the scene, they gather some blood evidence, and there's a couple blood types there. There's type O and there's type B. Well, type O was Helen's, so that blood type was eliminated. So then they looked at the type B, which they figured had to be the perpetrator. So that was tested by the lab, and it was determined that it was type B non-secretor type blood and that is a pretty rare blood type so they're not really they're not really getting anywhere real quick and that they call in the FBI to help them out and the FBI said that this person is going to be male he's going to be young unprepared a loner with low self uh, low self esteem and they said it's probably related to the other attacks or attempted attacks. And, uh, and the police did have a, a suspect at this point because they had gotten a, a lead from someone that, that said a guy they knew had fresh scratches on his arm the next morning. And he was kind of fit that profile. His name was, was Bruce Allen Smith. And the FBI thought that that he seemed like a, a pretty good suspect and his history kind of matched what they had expected this suspect would have. So the Beatrice police, they, 
they look for this guy, this this Bruce Allen Smith, and uh, uh, they find a friend of his, and that friend says that he was at the bar with him the night before the murder, and that at that point Bruce had said that he was going to get some one way or another. So shortly after he left the bar, they go out to this party. I think it was outside of town somewhere, and then Bruce gets kicked out for trying to sexually assault a girl there. So a friend takes him downtown Beatrice. Um, it's kind of middle of the night at some point in the night, and the friend drops him off downtown Beatrice. And not too far from where he was dropped off, the, the police, when they were investigating around that area, they find a girl's wallet that was from the party that he was at. And this girl had reported her wallet stolen. So... Her wallet is there, probably missing money, but her ID and other stuff is in there. So they find her wallet, like, I think it was a block or two from Helen's apartment building. So now we've got Bruce that was at the party that was trying to assault a girl and stole someone's wallet, it appeared, and then, and then ditched it about a block or two from the murder scene the same night of the murder. So now... And, and, and you have a friend that says that when he saw him the next day, he had some fresh scratches on his arm. So now they're, they're looking for this guy, Bruce, and they can't find him. They find him a few days later in Oklahoma City. And he says he has no idea what they're talking about or anything. And so the police take a blood sample from him. They do determine he's type B, but he is a secretor. So they eliminate him. And then a, a few years pass, the case is going cold, and then an ex-Beatrice policeman named Bert Searcy, he is investigating for the family, for Helen's family, and he eventually becomes a deputy sheriff, and he wants to kind of show up the Beatrice police that he used to work for, and, you know, because the uh, sheriff's office and the Beatrice police are kind of... Uh, competing agencies so he becomes a deputy sheriff for the gage county sheriff's office and he is allowed to take over this case by the county attorney because it has been cold for a while and so all of a sudden he has a confidential informant who knows who did it and this girl, her name is Lisa Podendorf Brown, and she was 17 at the time, but at the time that he's interviewing her now, she's 21. So Lisa tells this story on tape, and she says that on the night of the murder, she said her and her boyfriend, who is now her husband, had saw a car driven by Tom Winslow. They saw this car pull into the alley behind the old telephone building, on the night of the murder and she said she saw Tom and Joanne Taylor get out of the car and also Joseph White who they called Lobo. So Lisa said the next morning about 7 o'clock or 7.30 in the morning um, she said across the street there was chaos going on because the the police were at the telephone building because of the murder and and uh, she said that Joanne came running up to her in the park because I guess the the park was right next to the you know right next to the telephone building and real close to the uh, high school so they're waiting in the park Joanne runs up to her and says she needs some money to get the heck out of town because she tells Lisa that that, uh, yeah, the, the body of the woman that they found over there that's dead. And she says, yeah, you know, uh, I was involved in it. And it is what Lisa said. So, so Lisa says, Joanne said she was involved in it. And she said, Tom was involved in it. And also, um, Joseph White. So that, that's what Lisa says she was told the next morning about seven or seven thirty in the morning. She, she didn't say if she gave her any money or not. So, Anyhow, at, at this point, then the the police need to talk to some of these people. So they look up Tom Winslow, and he's already in prison. You know, this is four years later, so I don't remember what he was in prison for. But he was in prison, and they went to visit him and and basically said that, hey, you've been placed at the, at the crime scene of the Helen Wilson case, and uh, you better you better spill what what was going on 
or you're going to get the, you know, the electric chair. And Tom originally says, hey, I wasn't there. I was at work that night. I don't know what's what you're talking about. And, and uh, you know, Bert Searcy, who is there investigating and recording, he's uh, talking to him and says, well, the prosecutors, they can't, they can't get you a deal unless you spill some of the details. And then we can help get you out of prison and, and get you a deal. So then... Um, you know, then the, the tape that he's recording him, it turns off for a while. And then, then all of a sudden he turns it on uh, a little bit later and all of a sudden Tom's story has changed. He says he was there with Joanne Taylor and Joseph White and that they parked by the telephone building in the alley there. And, and uh, he starts getting all these details on tape that now, now corroborate what uh, the confidential informant said. But he didn't. He didn't know any of these details before when it was being recorded. So kind of, kind of mysterious. And then, then Tom says that he went. He went downstairs and no one was home. Well, then the tape shuts off again because Helen didn't live downstairs. She lived upstairs. So the tape is off for a little while, and then, and then Bert turns it on again, and then all of a sudden he says that they went upstairs, not downstairs, and they went up to, to her. Um, went up to her apartment and so now all these details are are continuing to line up with all these stops of the tape and prompting of of what to say by bird is what it appears is going on it was kind of witness coercing or tampering so um anyhow so Tom says, oh, well, yeah, uh, I guess I was there, but I didn't take part in anything. And he says, uh, Joseph White, he's the one that, that sexually assaulted her. And he tells this story. They managed to get him a deal, and they get, they get Tom out of jail for now. And so then they need to go after Joseph White and Joanne Taylor, and they're trying to find them. And they they find out that Joseph White had done some had done some uh, porno type movies in Hollywood, and and uh, but he left that that scene. He was a you know a big muscular guy, and and uh, he had came from California with Joanne Taylor. And anyhow, so they're looking, they're looking for him around town that he wasn't from there to begin with. So I believe by the time they, they find him, he's back in Alabama where he's from. And Joanne is back in North Carolina, I believe where she was from. They were only in town for a while for Joanne's kids, I believe at the, around the time of the murder. So Anyhow, they they find them, they arrest both of them, and they basically tell them, you need to spill the details as to what happened and how you're involved, you're being placed at the scene of a murder. So, at first, they're confused, and like everyone else, they say, well, I wasn't there, I don't know what, what you're talking about. And then they get threatened with the electric chair, and there's too many people that are saying you were there, and, and you know, you better spill your guts, and you better make a deal, or you're going to get the electric chair. So there's all these threats going on. So then Joanne, she makes a statement that she says, oh, uh, the you know, that night we were at Helen's then, and uh, she lives in a little white house, and we were there to do some yard work. And obviously these details don't match up. She didn't live in a, in a little house. She didn't have a yard. They wouldn't have been there to do yard work. She lived in a, a dark brick building that had no yard she lived in an apartment and so none of these details matched up they're just reaching for something they could possibly say because they were getting getting threatened in this situation so um joanne says uh though that she never talked to the confidential informant you know she never talked to her or or anything then the then the tapes were turned off bert turned off the tapes and and uh and then she's talked to, and then they're turned back on in a little while. Then she says that she did talk to to Lisa. And now she knows that the building was a brick building. And now she knew that there was a, a $5 bill that was on the floor next to the dead body or right by the dead body. And, and, and so all these details with all these 
prompting type situations seem to start to match up with what investigator Bert Searcy wants them to say or wants these facts to line up like this. Now, Bert's not alone in this. He's got another assistant deputy that is also a psychologist in town, and this is Dr. Wayne Price. So he's a psychologist. He's a, a reserve sheriff's deputy, and he's working with, with Bert Searcy on this whole situation. So the interesting thing here is that Dr. Price was Joanne's psychologist for many years and had recommending terminating her parental rights to her kids. So he knew that she had borderline personality disorder and she had all kinds of, uh, you know, mental, mental health issues and, and things like that. And anyhow, but with, with his situation, he said that, uh, that when, Joanne was giving her statements when she was arrested and everything that that she was totally competent even though he wasn't there in North Carolina when she was arrested and videotaped and and the statements and and stuff like that were made so Dr. Price just apparently says this so that anything she said or whatever could uh, be held against her or would hold up in court even though he wasn't there so Anyhow, and he knows she's mentally unstable to begin with. He's been treating her for a long time. So, anyhow, at this point, as they're questioning um, Joanne once she's been brought back to Beatrice, she says that Tom Winslow was the other person that raped Helen. So if you remember Tom, they got him a deal and got him out of prison. So now that Tom was supposedly also involved in the assault, then he gets rearrested and he gets put back in jail. And at this point, he said, well, he lied about the whole thing. He was just trying to get a deal, and he was promised that he would get a deal and get out if he agreed with them on things. So this spiraled out of control for him already, and all of them so far. So now you have three people arrested for murder, and there's no evidence that lines up. Their, their blood types don't match. None of the details or the evidence match up with these people. So... Three people so far, and they're continuing to go down this road. Now a jailhouse informant says that they heard that, that Deborah Sheldon was involved, and she was a very low mentally deficient, um, you know, had very low mental function. And they went and talked to her, and they it sounds like they basically coerced her into saying that she was there, even though she didn't really know any details. And then Deborah had also been seeing the psychologist, Dr. Price, as a patient for many years. So Dr. Price, he says he's an expert in repressed memories, and he helped Deborah remember who else may be there. And she said her friend James Dean may have been there. And so they go question this gentleman, James Dean, and he's clueless about things. And anyhow, so they basically pin things, try to pin things on him at that point because they say, okay, other people are saying you were there, James, you were, you were involved. So they, they arrest him and don't tell him for a long time that he's being arrested and questioned for murder. And they then tell him that you need to confess. There's a lot of people saying you were there and you were in the middle of this and this resulted in the in the murder. And if you don't confess, you're going to get the electric chair. But we can help you get a better deal so that doesn't happen. And so at, at this point, um, Dr. Wayne Price, this supposed expert in repressed memories, he showed pictures and videos and and stuff like that from the crime scene to um, James Dean and then then they gave James Dean the polygraph and then they they told him he failed very badly and he needed to confess now so he's he's worried he's confused they tell him he's going to get the chair and uh at this point, you know, he's he's already been arrested too and he's sitting there not sure what to do. So now you have five arrests with no matching evidence. None of them have the right blood type. None of them have any evidence that really can prove that they were there. So Bert Searcy pushed for who else was involved. 
and that they all needed to fess up. And a couple of them came up with the name of Kathy Gonzalez. They said, oh, well, I think she was there. And, the, and these people, they all knew each other. So at this point, they say Kathy Gonzalez was there, and this is a six person. And, they, and when they test Kathy's blood, well, she does have type B blood, but she's a woman. So she couldn't have been the source of the type B non-secretor blood that the killer left and the and also the semen that the killer left. That apparently didn't matter to Bert Searcy and, and the, uh, the county sheriff's office. So they convinced her that she needed to confess or she was going to get the chair. And anyhow, at, at this point, they tell her, there's all these people saying that you were there, and we got, you know, five more people against you, and if you confess, we can get you, you know, ten years, maybe you'll only serve, serve five or so, and you'll be out. And she was worried also about getting the electric chair the way that they were threatening her. So they offered her a aiding and abetting of second-degree murder, and she went ahead and she took that that deal and the other two women and James Dean they all took that deal too cuz the way the police were presenting it the you had all these witnesses against you and and even the you know the sheriffs and and the psychologists and everyone is is against you and no one's going to believe you weren't there you need to you need to take this deal um so you don't get the electric chair so so four of them have taken the deal now and Joseph White and Tom Winslow, they refused to admit that they were involved at all. And so a trial was set. Joseph went first in October of 89. And they had to move the, the trial to a county or two over to Fairbury. So Bert Searcy, he was becoming a hero in the town because everyone thought, wow, no one can figure this out, but Bert has this all figured out. And in the trial, they vilified Joseph White because he had been in those uh, not-so-good movies in Hollywood and, and other things, and, and this uh, very conservative jury thought that he was probably a pretty evil character. And so... They did a really good job of making him look bad um, in spite of none of the evidence matched up or put him there. And the way that they did this was the prosecution would not say that the blood was a match. They would say that the blood on the scene was similar to Kathy Gonzalez's blood. And they said that the semen um, was similar to Tom's blood type or that the the semen from Joseph could not be positively ID'd from him, but um, they didn't they didn't say that it could exclude him or anything like that. They used these uh, kind of vague words that made things sound one way when uh, it wasn't really entirely like that. So anyhow. Um, when Joseph took the stand, they showed him a picture of Helen Wilson and asked him if he knew who that was. And he said, I don't know, just some old woman. I don't know who that is. And I guess the, the jury was just dumbfounded, you know. And, of course, he didn't know who Helen Wilson was if he wasn't there. But they they took that as uh, as disrespect and, and everything and that he was an evil person. So the prosecutor closed with the words, and it was kind of a baseball analogy. They said, you know all these witnesses didn't all agree. They didn't hit a home run, but they were there, and they hit enough doubles and singles to bring it all home. So that is what the prosecutor said. In other words, everything doesn't really interconnect, but we believe everybody, you know, may have been there. And, you know, everything's not going to completely match and point the finger, but but you need to convict them all. So anyhow, or some of them had already taken the, taken the deal at this point and testified against, you know, Joseph. So anyhow, the jury... The jury went out, and it only took them four hours, and they came back, and they said Joseph White was guilty, and he got life. Tom saw what happened, and he decided, oh, no, I, I 
could get life or I could get the chair. So Tom then pled no contest and he didn't, he didn't wait for his trial and he got 50 years. At this point, Joseph never gave up. And he said that, uh, you know, I'll be proven innocent. The truth will come out. And at some point, I believe about 15 years later, he had sent a letter and this attorney, Doug Stratton, got this letter and he went to meet with Joseph. And, and after talking to him, he really believed that Joseph maybe was totally innocent. And then he looked over things and he realized that Tom didn't plead until after Joseph got convicted. So he looked at that and, and uh, he went and he talked to Tom. And Tom was in tears and he says, you know what? Yeah, I was never there. I don't even really know what happened. And, uh, you know, I was just getting threatened with the electric chair and, and he said I folded. And so this attorney starts to believe the, the two of them. And he said in 2001, there was a DNA statute that was passed that said a, you know, a convicted person could request DNA um, processing, which wouldn't have been available in the 80s when, uh, you know, when this case, you know, the DNA was collected and everything. So, so this attorney, he goes to the Beatrice Police Department and he sends a request for them to test the DNA from this case. So I think he's keeping his fingers crossed. He's hoping that they still have all of the evidence. And they actually did, and it was very well preserved, and they sent a bunch of it off. And about eight months later, the results came back, and the DNA did not match any one of the six suspects. So at this point, DNA is a lot more sophisticated, and, and they can basically rule all these suspects out. Well, the Gage County attorney didn't want to... They didn't want to let him out of jail. So at this point, they set up a task force to prove that they were guilty. And they, they told the family, don't worry, you know, they're guilty, we'll keep them in jail. And they sent out a bunch more of the evidence intending to find their DNA profiles on some of the other evidence. And a bunch more pieces of evidence were sent out. And when everything came back, no matches to any of the six people. The DNA still showed only one male profile and it didn't match any of the six. So they went back to square one. The, the county attorney and, and, and uh, everyone, they had to start reinvestigating things and figure out what happened. So they determined the confidential informant, she had lied and, and uh, they had looked, they went out to the places that she said that they saw the car and saw the people getting out of the car and they determined that that was impossible. Where she said she was, there was a bank building in the way. She never could have saw through the bank building and seen people parking in that alley and getting out of the car and all that stuff. Apparently this was never looked at at that point. And the time frame that she gave for, you know, 7, 7 or 7.30 in the morning for... Um, you know, the morning of the murder to have Joanne come up to her and the police and all the chaos going on already. That was all a lie too, because they didn't even know that uh, Helen was dead yet. So they start putting this together that for some reason, the confidential informant lied or, you know, I don't know, was coerced or something. They didn't know what the deal were, was, but uh, at this point they start putting all this stuff together and, and, I believe this is like 2008. Three of them have already served their time and are and gotten out, and three of them are still in prison. And this is around um, 20 years or so. So, in 2009, they let the rest of them out, and and they were all exonerated. And they looked at the Bruce Allen Smith evidence again. And, you know, he lived close to the murder scene and, and all those details. They, they still had his profile. They sent it back off and they determined when the details came back that there was a lab mess up and the lady that was in charge of the lab in Oklahoma City, Joyce Gilchrist, she was a chemist and she had done a lot of faulty DNA work and sloppy work and she was fired in 2001 for just not not giving correct evidence or doing sloppy work or whatever. So they test the results again and it comes back that Bruce Allen Smith is type B blood non-secretor 
and now DNA is more sophisticated. They match the DNA profile to him. So now they need to look for him. They know that it was him all along. But unfortunately, Bruce had died in 1992. So at this point, they know who did it. They know none of the six did it. And they know the guy that did it is dead. So Joseph tries to get on. Joseph White tries to get on with his life. He goes back to Alabama where he's from. He gets engaged to his high school sweetheart. He gets a job. And uh, he is the leader in a civil suit for the all six of them against Gage County. All of a sudden, a short while later, Joseph White is found mysteriously crushed by a machine at the coal plant that he works at. And it seemed extremely mysterious. And this was while this case was ramping up. And, of course, this case did continue on without him. So it seemed like someone was sent to kill him, or a lot of people thought that, to quash this this whole um, civil case and not make the county sheriff's office look bad. It carried on without him, and the suit was eventually settled for $28.1 million for the six of them. And uh, the... Gage County, they had to raise the property taxes to the maximum amount to pay for the sheriff's office incompetence, or I don't even know what you want to call it. I mean, coercing people to agree to certain facts and uh, ignoring the real evidence. It it was just a, an appalling case. It's just, it's really crazy. So that is the story of the Beatrice Six and how they got convicted when none of the evidence matched them. Like and subscribe if you like these kind of stories.